I'm a developer relations engineer at Affinity and I'm really happy to participate in the Motoko Bootcamp as a mentor for the second time. The last time I talked about HTTP outcalls and the Bitcoin direct integration. So if those topics are interesting to you, feel free to check out the recording from the last bootcamp. Today I'm talking about inter-canister calls and timers. And we are starting with inter-canister messaging or inter-canister calls. And yeah, you probably might ask yourself, what are inter-canister calls? And as you might know already, the internet computer consists of many smaller blockchains called subnets. And a subnet can host many canisters. And inter-canister calls are a way to enable transparent inter- and intra-subnet canister messaging. And what that means is that for you as a developer, it doesn't matter if the canister that you want to call lives on the same or on a different subnet. The communication between canisters is via asynchronous messages. So they don't block on sending a message, but process the response when it eventually arrives. So an asynchronous call produces a future, and this future can be awaited. In the meantime, while the canister waits for the response, other messages are processed. Now you might be wondering, why do we need them? Maybe until now you always only deployed a single canister when you developed a dApp. Like in this case, for example, where we have a social dApp that consists of a single canister that contains all the dApps code and also the state. But there are actually use cases that are really hard to implement without inter-canister calls. And one good example here are payments. The comic here shows an established payment flow, which is called the transfer notify flow, where the client has to send funds to a unique account reserved for his principal. So in the first step, the user asks for the unique ledger account to transfer the funds to. That's the call right here. Get account and then we receive back a unique account. Then, upon transferring the funds by interacting with the ledger canister, the user has to notify the receiving canister that the funds have been sent, and in this case, by calling the getPrice method. And this is where we need inter-canister calls, because the receiver canister now has to check with the ledger canister if the funds really have been transferred. This happens here. And if so, again, we are using an inter-canister call to then transfer the funds to the treasury account of the receiver. This happens here. And then if everything turns out good, the user receives the service or the good that he paid for, in our case, uh, the price, because this example comes from a price oracle. Another example could be that you are building an NFT project where the NFTs are generated programmatically during the mint. And because you want to have a clear separation of concerns, instead of storing the assets inside the NFT ledger canister, which would be this one, you want to store them in a dedicated asset canister on the right hand side. And therefore we need an inter canister call to store the generated asset in the assets canister. It could also be that you are building a DAO for an NFT project. And here you want to use the NFTs held by a principal as the voting power associated with a vote cast by the principal. And therefore, for each vote being cast, you have to make an inter-canister call to the NFT canister and check how many NFTs the caller actually owns before you can then calculate the voting power within the DAO canister. And there are a couple of different ways for implementing inter-canister calls with Motoko. And the one thing they all have in common is that we need the methods signature that we want to call and also the canister ID. So the identifier of the canister that we want to call. For example, what we could do is um, if the canister is part of our own project, so if we are actually coding it, we could specify um, a dependency in our dfx.json and that would allow us to pretty easily import the canister that we want to call 
in the canister that issues the call. Another possible uh, situation is that the canister is deployed on mainnet, but it's not part of your project. And here it could be that the, the source calls, uh, the source code or the, the WASM file um, is available. And then you could either um, like pull the source code into your own project and compile that, and then again reference it like uh, in the first situation um, from within your defects.json as a dependency. Um, you could, if only the wasm file is available, uh, also within your dfx.json just reference the wasm file together with a candid file, um, which basically tells dfx the available methods um, on the canister. If the source code or the wasm are not available, but only the interface, you could use a so-called actor reference to import the canister into your own canister and then basically make inter canister calls. It could also be that the canister is not known yet. And here it could either be that you know the interface of the canister, then again, you would be able to use an actor reference or the interface is not known. And then you would need to use a um, raw call. <clears throat> That's pretty experimental um, right now, but it seems to work already. So, if all of this sounded a bit confusing to you, don't worry, because we will cover each possible way of implementing intercanister calls in the live coding part of this talk. Now I want to mention some caveats when doing intercanister calls. So things that you might not be aware of when you start out doing your first intercanister calls. But first we need to understand a few properties about message execution on the internal computer. And the first is that only a single message is processed at a time per canister and that message ex execution is sequential and never parallel for a single canister. Also a shared function call that executes without executing an await expression never suspends and executes atomically, so executes as a single message. And atomically means that it appears like either none or all of the instructions are performed. And for the next couple of slides, you will see those rectangles here. And the rectangles indicate the boundaries, let's say, <clears throat> of a, a message on the internal computer. So each intercanister call triggers a message. But when making intercanister calls using an await, the code after the call is executed as a separate message. And that means that all state changes and message sends up until this point are irre irrevocably committed. So awaits act as commit points like an explicit return or a throw expression and also like uh, ex uh, implicitly exiting from a shared function by producing a result. And in the example here, in calling the shared function, we actually produce two messages. The first me message is the orange block, this one, and the second message is the blue block. If no await is used, the code after the callback is executed in the same message and the intercanister call is queued. The drawback here is that we don't even know if the message failed or what the result of the message was. Um, for example, if the um, message traps, it could be that it was yeah, never sent. And in this example, the shared function executes atomically. So even though we make an intercanister call, no commit point is reached as we don't await the response. Instead, the intercanister call is queued and executed upon exiting the shared function call by producing a result. So to summarize, a shared function call can potentially be divided into many messages by awaits. And with this knowledge, we should avoid traps after an await. Now you might wonder what a trap is. A trap is a non-recoverable runtime failure 
caused by, for example, a division by zero, an out-of-bounds array indexing, a numeric overflow, cycle exhaustion, or an, ex an assertion failure, for example. And on a trap, or also called a panic, the modifications to the canister state for the current message are not applied. And an atomic shared function whose execution traps, like in this example, um, has no visible effect on the state of the enclosing actor or its environment, and any state change is reverted, and any message that it has sent is revoked. So in this example, even though we increment the variable a during a message execution, later on a trap occurs. And that means that any modifications to the canister state are rolled back and a would again hold zero. So even with an intercanister call, if we don't await the result, the message is only queued. And in fact, all state changes and messages uh, sent are tentative during execution, and they are committed only after a successful commit point is reached. And in the case of this example, if the shared function exits by producing a result. And as we trap, we don't reach a commit point and the message will never be sent. If we do await though, the behavior changes. If we trap in the second message here in the blue box, the canister state changes up until that point, so up until that point within the blue box, are discarded. And that is because a trap will only revoke changes made since the last commit point. And as we learned already, an await is, an, is such a commit point. And in this concrete example, that means that after trapping, A still holds um, 1. So in particular, a non-atomic function that does multiple awaits um, in that case, a trap will only revoke the changes attempted since the last await, and all preceding effects will have been committed and cannot be undone. And state changes from earlier messages, and in particular the message um, from the orange box here, have already been applied, as that message already executed successfully when we run the, the blue um, message. And Here's an example where this can lead to unwanted results. And this example uh, implements a refund logic. So what we do is that we first check the recorded balance of the caller, and we then initiate a transfer of that balance back to the caller. And if the transfer was successful, we update the caller's balance to zero. But now on the second message, in the blue one, we actually trap because of a call to a method that updates some statistics. And this method, for some reason, traps. So all the state changes since the last commit, so since we made our await call here, um, will be reverted. And in this particular case, that means that the caller's balance will still hold the initial value, even though we already transferred the ICP to them, so we already refunded them. And this means that the caller will be able to call the refund method over and over, draining the canister of its funds. So that's pretty bad. Another thing to be aware of is that the messages from interleaving calls have no reliable execution ordering. So let's consider the previous example and remove that bad call to the statistic method that trapped. And it's a bit better now, but if we assume that the refund method is being called twice in parallel or even more often, then we face another problem. Because the message ordering is not reliable, for this particular example, there are two possible message orderings if refund is called twice in parallel. In the first scenario, scenario, everything goes according to plan. So we execute the first message of the first call. The user has 10 ICP. And then 
so with the second message execution, um, we refund the user and the uh, user now has um, zero ICP. And then we execute the second call and again we check the balance of the user. The user has zero ICP now because the refund already happened and no refund uh, will be given to the user for the second call because there's nothing to be refunded. But in the second scenario, things look not as good anymore because in this case, the first message for both calls is executed first. So twice, it seems like the user has 10 ICP. And only after the first message for each of the calls is being executed, then the second message of the first call is executed, and after that, the second message of the second call is being executed. And this means that in this scenario, the user will be refunded 20 ICP in total, so 10 ICP here and another 10 ICP there. Even though the user initially only had a balance of 10 ICP. So as you can see, again, not really nice for us. And the learning here is that your code should result in the correct state regardless of message ordering. One final thing to be aware of is that even though every inter-canister call is guaranteed to receive a response, either from the canister or synthetically produced by the protocol, the response does not have to be successful, but can also be a reject response. And the reject may either come from the called canister, but it may also be generated by the internet computer itself. And such system-generated rejects can occur at any time, and they cannot be controlled by canister offers. And thus, it's important that the calling canister handles reject responses as well. And you can handle those responses by using a try-catch statement to catch rejects. Another thing to be aware of is that you should only call trustworthy canisters because if a canister depends on another canister smart contract, so if it makes inter-canister calls to it, it's essential that the canister smart contract that one depends on is owned by a decentralized governance system. Otherwise, if it has a controller, they could modify the smart contract without others noticing it to, for example, steal any assets held by the canister. Um, an example here could be a DeFi protocol that depends on an Oracle canister to receive price, prices of real-world assets. And people use the canister because it has a great implementation and it uses actually multiple Web2 APIs to fetch data and then does some like normalization uh, and so on and so on. So good code. But the problem is that the canister is not black hole, so it has a controller and that controller is not a DAO, but just like a single natural person. And maybe one day the developer turns nefarious and he might submit many positions to your DeFi platform and for those positions only return tiny prices, allowing them to drain funds out of your protocol. So again, would be really bad if that happened. So let's talk about the second topic of this talk, which are timers. And timers are single expiration or periodic canister calls with specified minimum timeout or interval. And that's pretty special because on Ethereum, for example, state changes have to be triggered by external accounts, but on the IC with the use of timers, state changes can actually be triggered by the smart contract itself. And for Motoko, there's the timer base library available, and that is an abstraction over the low level system API. And it offers three methods, namely set timer, cancel timer, and recurring timer. And they are used to set a one-off timer, <clears throat> cancel a timer, or set a recurring timer. And as a use case, for example, you might be launching a new NFT collection and you don't want to give the information away what the asset that is tied to the NFT looks like to the users right away. You want to make them wait maybe for a day until they know which NFT they minted. 
So what you do is you set a one-off 24-hour timer that upon expiration reveals the assets so then people are actually able to see what NFT they bought. Another example could be that you build a DAO and you want to implement a voting period for proposals of 24 hours. So when a new proposal is created, you also register a timer that up, that up on uh, expiration changes the status of the proposal from open to closed. So before the timer is executed, the proposal is open and it accepts vote, uh, votes. And then after 24 hours, the voting period ended. And now if people try to send a vote um, for this particular uh, proposal, um, it's basically being rejected. And there are some limitations to timers. And the first one are um, that if you upgrade the canister, all the timers are deactivated and the list of timers has been cleared. And it's actually up to the canister developer to serialize the timers in the canister pre-upgrade and then reactivate them in the canister post-upgrade method if needed. Second thing are that to isolate the tasks from each other and also from the scheduling log logic, the um, timers library initiates a self canister call to execute each task. And there are a few implications here. The first one is that for those self canister calls, the normal inter canister call costs apply. And the second one is that the tasks to be executed are added at the end of the canister input queue. So depending on the canister and the subnet load, the actual execution might be delayed. And also as the canister output queue is limited in size, apparently um, 500 messages can be held by, by a single queue. Um, this also implicitly limits the number of tasks which might be scheduled in one round. Um, also, the timers library uses relative time to schedule tasks. So if you wanted to use absolute time, you as a developer need to calculate the duration between now and the point in time or use a third party library for that. <laughs>